Hey, hey, you guys. Today we have some pretty big news about Miami-Dade State Attorney Catherine Fernandez Rundle. There's been a major call for an independent ethics review of her office, following some pretty big allegations of misconduct. According to a press release, which is what you see on the screen here, and it is from the Florida Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, there's some big concerns about a win-at-all-cost mentality with, with Rundle's office. We're going to see in the press release that they're highlighting some specific high-profile cases, including the OnlyFans model Courtney Clinney's murder trial in Miami-Dade. So we're going to start by reading the full press release, get all the details straight from the release itself, and then we're going to look at a news article from the Miami Herald, which has some statements and responses. So let's jump right into it. Again, on your screen right here is from the Florida Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Now, I want you to look on the left-hand column. There's a section on the left-hand side that says Past President Jude Facadomo. You might know that name because that is the attorney, one of the attorneys representing Kim and Deborah Clenny in the laptop case. So, Past President here. We're going to get some statements from him as well. So, this release was sent out on April 17th. That was just a few days ago. It reads, the Florida Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, FACDL, is appalled by recent and ongoing unethical conduct by the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office, along with retaliatory targeting of criminal defense lawyers. In one case, State of Florida v. Corey Smith, Judge Andrea Wolfson issued an order on March 6, 2024, plainly identifying instances of unethical and potentially illegal conduct by Miami-Dade Assistant State Attorneys. FACDL has been advised that the senior prosecutor subject of that order was allowed to resign with no further consequences. FACDL also has learned that a second prosecutor implicated by Judge Wolfson's order faced no discipline whatsoever. As referenced by Judge Wolfson in her order disqualifying the two assistant state attorneys, it's apparent that the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office has lost sight of its ethical obligations to the citizens of Miami-Dade County and its duty to the rule of law. Another case, State of Florida vs. Kim Clenny et al., the defendants are similarly subject to seemingly unethical conduct. The defendant, Courtney Clenny, is charged with second-degree murder in a companion case. It would appear to be a straightforward matter on its face. Courtney claims that her stabbing of an abusive boyfriend was justified. The state believes otherwise. Instead of ethically addressing a very serious matter involving a homicide, the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office has allowed one of its assistant state attorneys to run amok targeting criminal defense lawyers acting in their function as client advocates and creating a distraction. Without a trial date in sight for the homicide, the case has featured a young... Now, that happens to be where I need to scroll down. But we know there's a status hearing coming up, right? So I think that's interesting. They're releasing this on April 17th, just a couple days before the status hearing. And th that doesn't mean that we're going to get a trial date on the status hearing coming up, but we could. But it continues. Without a trial date in sight for the homicide, the case has featured a young prosecutor leaking attorney-client communications of the defense to the press. Going further, the same young prosecutor has engineered the arrest of the defendant's parents. In doing so, the same prosecutor has implicated opposing counsel, respected and longtime defense attorneys, and claimed criminal conduct. The actions of this prosecutor are so far outside the norms of the criminal justice system that it is apparent he is using his state attorney badge as a sword and not a shield. Worse yet, this conduct has been brought to the attention of his supervisors, and no discipline of any kind has been enforced. The Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office has surpassed mere acquiescence of unethical behavior and is now encouraging it. The purported criminal conduct consists of no more than reviewing, in the context of the fact-specific case, possible defense evidence. This is a standard, necessary obligation of the defense lawyer in every case where such evidence may exist. Not doing so would be malpractice. Without repercussion, the prosecutor has dug through reams of electronic attorney-client privilege defense communications, conduct worthy of investigation by the Florida Bar and the court. Now remember, Florida Bar and the court itself, those are two different bodies that have two different powers, and they could both look at this independently. Speaking to the courts in pursuit of this tangent, the young prosecutor's affidavits contain glaring omissions of relevant fact, specifically omitting that there was an attorney-client relationship between the targets and the attorneys and that all information was gleaned because of the state and law enforcement reading text messages between the defense team and their client. In normal circumstances, more seasoned, managing prosecutors would step in. For reasons that remain unclear, that has not occurred. What does seem clear is that Miami-Dade State Attorney has fostered conditions permissive to a toxic culture. As a result, within this culture, prosecutors act contrary to their ethical duties. 
Ms. Fernandez Rundle's prosecutors seem to be discouraged to disregard the rules of court and conduct in favor of a win-at-all-costs approach. More representative of that culture is the disdain with which the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office apparently views the vital constitutional function of defense counsel. In their most recent filing, the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office plainly accuses two respected criminal defense attorneys of conspiring to commit the very offense with which their clients, Ms. Clinney's parents, are charged. Specifically, the state is alleging that the act of defense attorneys reviewing material ignored at their client's apartment by law enforcement is in and of itself a crime. This position shows a fundamental lack of understanding of the role of a criminal defense lawyer and outright disdain for every citizen's Sixth Amendment right to effective representation of counsel. More disconcertingly, by naming those lawyers and accusing them of a crime in conjunction with discharging their duties, the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office abuses its authority. In Florida, charging a person with a crime falls entirely within the purview of the respective state attorney's office. That power is almost wholly unreviewable and must be discharged ethically and with great care. While most state attorneys understand the weight of this authority and act accordingly, the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office seems not to simply overlook, but rather condone ongoing misuses of power. Readers of Florida legal documents are familiar with the concept that criminal offenses are charged and potential criminal penalties sought to protect the peace and dignity of the state of Florida. In the case of Ms. Clinney's parents, charging decisions and resulting arrests have instead been improperly made to protect the ego of a young prosecutor. Worse yet, the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office has now doubled down and is attempting to bully or target the loan check and balance on its power, criminal defense lawyers. Ms. Fernandez Rundle's young assistant has besmirched the names of two FACDL's members and all but threatened them with arrest and prosecution. This arrest and prosecution would flow from defense lawyers having the temerity to zealously fulfill their constitutional roles. The Florida Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers will not tolerate this abuse of their members. The association, on behalf of its involved members, demands an immediate and formal apology. Addressing the citizens facing criminal prosecution, all criminal charges pursued substantially to protect the ego of a young assistant must be dismissed. Further, considering the available facts in both Clenny and Smith, FACDL is calling for the dismissal of the offending prosecutors and a full independent ethics review within the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office. And then it's signed here. For more information, contact Luke Newman, current president. So that's some interesting stuff. There are some general grievances stated here, but the cases they focus on are State of Florida versus Corey Smith. Uh, I believe that's a death penalty case. And then State of Florida versus Kim Clenney with the companion case against just Courtney Clenney for the murder and interception of wire charge also tied in with this mention. Now, if we hop over to this article from the Miami Herald, we'll read this quick. We get some statements. So State Attorney Fernandez Rundle faces mounting criticism over prosecutor conduct. Miami-Dade State Attorney Catherine Fernandez Rundle is facing calls by a statewide organization of criminal defense attorneys for an independent ethics review of her office amid new claims of misconduct by her prosecutors. Just weeks ago, Rundle rebuffed a call from a Miami group of criminal defense attorneys for an outside look at prosecutors' handling of cases, after two prosecutors were thrown off a high-profile murder case by the judge. In a three-page statement sent Friday morning to its 1,400 members, the Florida Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers alleged Rundle allows unethical behavior to go unchecked. The office has a win-at-all-cost mentality, abuses its authority, and has fostered conditions permissive to a toxic culture, reads the statement, which is what we just read. The Florida Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers is appalled by recent and ongoing unethical conduct by the Miami State Attorney's Office, along with retaliatory targeting of criminal defense lawyers. The organization is alleging misconduct in high-profile murder case like the OnlyFans model and accused killer Courtney Clenny's case. The lawyer's group called for the removal of prosecutor Khalil Quenin. And that's him, if he looks familiar to you. The case is the second in two months in which Rundle's prosecutors were accused of misconduct. In the murder resentencing case of gangster Corey Smith, Judge Andrea Ricker Wolfson was so incensed by the tactics of prosecutors Michael Von Samst and Stephen Mitchell that she took the rare and for Rundle, embarrassing, step in early March of removing them from the case. Wolfson's order casts a shadow on Rundle's quest, just as she approaches another election to continue running the largest state attorney's office in Florida. Qualifying for candidates begins Monday and concludes Friday. Rundle, a 74-year-old Democrat, paid her candidate qualifying fee Wednesday to run for another four-year term. A Cuban-American, she was first appointed to the job in 1993, then won elections for three decades. The job pays $212,562 a year. An arrest and search warrant. Jude Facadomo, a past president of the statewide lawyers organization and an attorney representing Clenny's parents, Kim and Deborah Clenny, 
seized on the Wolfson order earlier this month, using it as a foundation for making larger accusations that Rundle's office has a permissive culture. In a motion filed April 8th to Judge Laura Cruz, he alleged vindictive prosecution of the parents and asked that the charges against them be dismissed. Rundle's office didn't respond immediately to a request for comment late Thursday, but pointed to a court document in the Clenny case in which the allegations of bias and misconduct are vigorously disputed. Much of what the Florida Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers said this week echoes what Facodomo filed in his motion. So, with him being a past president and him highlighting of the two cases he's highlighting, one of them is, you know, it's his clients. And one of the clients of that also has a companion case. And he's sticking it for the two attorneys in that case. This is no surprise. And I think the journalist is doing a good job presenting this, this detail here, highlighting that. Clenny, a social media phenom, is charged with second-degree murder in the 2022 stabbing death of her boyfriend, Christian Obamselli, at their Miami apartment. She's arguing self-defense. Her parents are charged in a separate but related case, accused of unauthorized access to a computer from the Miami crime scene. Now remember, Courtney is a co-defendant in this case, and then she also has a new charge that was tacked on on February 1st to her murder trial, interception uh, of wire communications. So this separate case is actually the three as co-defendants, and then Clenny has a charge that was uncovered through the search warrants for this case here. So a lot of moving parts. Though the case is unrelated to the Smith case and involves different prosecutors, Bacadomo ties them together in his motion. And then they call out the win at all cost type of mentality. Friction between defense attorneys and prosecutors first ignited, Facadomo said, when text messages emerged showing Prosecutor Quemin communicating with the case about then Miami Herald reporter David O'Valley. So, then Miami Herald reporter David O'Valley. In the exchange, Quinnin disparaged the defense team and revealed how much they were paid for taking the case, Facadomo complained in his motion. Defense attorneys on that case notified Quinnin's supervisor, Kathleen Hogue, in April of 2023, but Facadomo's motion says that ultimately nothing was done. In a reply to the motion, Hogue said that the text message In a reply to the motion, Hogue said that the text message conversation with the reporter broke no rules, but she spoke with Quinnin regarding his private communications and told him to refrain from discussing an open case with a personal friend. So this journalist is being characterized as a personal friend at this point. And I want to highlight here, we're looking back at April of 2023. Meanwhile, we had all of this buzz about the laptop and the parents' arrest and the new charges at the end of January of this year in 2024. So when we were looking at all those warrants and all that stuff, we were like, when did this exchange hands? What was the timeline? What was going on behind the scenes? Well, we're getting a peek behind the scenes of what was going on in spring of last year. So Facadomo says in his motion that Quinnen retaliated afterwards in his handling of the Clenny case. He charged Clenny and her parents with the little used statute regarding accessing a computer. The computer had been shared by Clenny and Obamselli and was left at the scene by crime scene processors. Facadomo said Kim Clenny, the defendant's father, took it when he was tasked with clearing out the entire apartment. It was then accessed using one of Obamselli's passwords. Nothing of value on the case was found. It was then accessed using one of Obamselli's passwords. Nothing of value to the case was found, Facadomo said or it would have been turned over. Particularly offensive to the attorney group was the fact that two of Clenny's defense attorneys were listed as principals in the alleged laptop crime. Hogue said in her court filing that they were included as witnesses, not uncharged parties to a crime. Quinnen also had the parents, both of whom were witnesses for the defense, arrested at their Texas home because of the laptop, and had a search warrant executed at the home of the defense's laptop expert. Facadomo cited the search warrant in his motion as another example of retaliation by Quinnen, because the expert's wife was the incoming president of the defense attorney's Miami chapter and had overseen a query to all the chapter's members asking if lawyers had experienced unethical conduct by Quinnen. To be clear, Facadomo wrote, Quinnen sought a search warrant at the home of the defense attorney that he believed to be responsible for the investigation into his unethical behavior. That could be interesting if we find out more and we don't find a you know, good faith basis for that. Hoag said Quinnen didn't make decisions alone. The prosecutors made decisions as a team. They didn't know the expert's wife was incoming chapter president, her motion says. Quinnen also read communications between the defense attorneys and their clients when he accessed their iCloud accounts, a violation of attorney-client privilege, Facadomo and the statewide lawyers group alleged. Hoag's motion says the prosecutors didn't know they were reading communications with her attorney. 
The statewide lawyers organization said in its statement that Quinnen's actions for the Clenny case are so far outside the norms of the criminal legal system. And then they have a quote here from the statement that we read. And in a 118-page response to the motion filed by Facadomo, Rundle's office said Facadomo is trying to capitalize on what happened in the unrelated Smith case. So their response, Rundle's response to the motion, I don't know the length of Facadomo's motion, but we know their press release was about two pages in a paragraph. But the motion he filed, which I'm sure is longer than two pages, the response to it was 118 pages. So that's interesting. The motion takes great pains to weave a web of entirely unrelated incidences and cases to cast aspersions onto a legal prosecution, the state attorney's office, and to otherwise defame an individual prosecutor. Make the witness unavailable. The defense attorney said Rundle tacitly endorses misbehavior by offering no consequences for it. The group said it had learned that after being removed from the Smith case by Judge Wolfson, Prosecutor Von Zampt was allowed to resign with no further consequences and co-prosecutor Mitchell, also implicated by Wolfson's order, faced no discipline whatsoever. Rundle's office didn't immediately respond to questions about whether either faced consequences. So perhaps this means something's pending? Maybe this, everything going on here, will put the pressure on? But stuff like this is interesting, right? Where it's kind of like, all right, you gotta go, but that's it. Water under the bridge. You know, is, is that enough? Is that enough? Personally, and we're allowed to differ, personally, the very least, this office should probably look into it a little bit more instead of letting it just be water under the bridge. That's my opinion. In the Smith case, Von Zamp was accused of a coordinating witness testimony and talking to a convicted killer about making a witness unavailable. Okay, we need a little bit more than just looking into it. If this If this can be substantiated, I mean, first of all, this needs to be looked into. I I triple down on what I said was the bare minimum here, but I want to elevate the bare minimum. I think you really need to look into this. If this is substantiated in any way, and a prosecutor may have been coordinating witness testimony and trying to talk to the, the, the convicted killer about making a witness, quote, unavailable, guys, yeah, we should be looking at that. Anyway. Judge Wolfson also called out co-prosecutor Mitchell for following Van Zamp's lead without concern for the consequences. So basically, Judge Wolfson decided, hey, the co-prosecutor is going along with all this. Though the revelations could have implications for other cases prosecuted by Van Zamp, Rundle has resisted the notion of conducting a proactive review of past cases. Okay, so what does resisted mean? Does she flat out say no? Because that's not good. I don't think that that's good. In March, the Miami chapter of the Criminal Defense Lawyers Association called for exactly that. Rundle said her own office will conduct a review. So we'll review ourselves and only of that one case. In an email to the Miami Herald two weeks ago, spokesman Ed Griffith said, It always goes without saying, whether a case was handled by Mr. Von Zamt or anyone else in my office, if there was any allegation of impropriety in any case or any allegation of actual innocence, we would, of course, entertain it on a case-specific basis. Facadomo told the Herald that Judge Wolfson's order shined a light on what's really been a poorly kept secret, that there are some prosecutors who are not being held accountable when these issues arise and are not being addressed by the state attorney. He said most of the prosecutors in the office fulfill their duties properly. Not to be cliche, but it's one of those a few bad apples situations, Facadomo told the Herald. When you're dealing with something as important and significant as a person's liberty, you can't have a few bad apples. And I want to say, uh, that's agreeable to me. You can't have a few bad apples. I think this article did a a pretty thorough dive. I think they, without making us lean a certain way, right? I think they said, hey, you know, Facadomo's making a motion in a specific case where he's representing the clients. And this press statement echoes that same thing. And that's something that we need to be privy to, right? We got to, that's important context to know. Uh, Facadomo could have some motives here, right? It would obviously benefit him if the prosecutor going after his clients was punished for misconduct. And I think it goes without saying that all of this stuff, if Rundle's not willing to look at this, and then they only want to look at this one case, a case-by-case basis, but this prosecutor has sat over other cases, maybe this co-prosecutor is not such a big deal, not much of a blip on the radar. 
but they are only reluctantly looking at one case that this guy von Zampt may have been talking about making witnesses unavailable, coordinating witness testimony. Is it just to only look at one case that was explicitly called out? Or would it be just to look at anything that he may have had the opportunity to do these things in, to win his case, to win by any means necessary? I think this is a big problem. I think some of this is maybe one of those where there's smoke, there's fire type things. And maybe it's possible Fakadomo is latching on to what's going on with this prosecutor and trying to extend the some type of complaint over to a case he's dealing with, to that prosecutor on that case. But at the same time, it could be problematic if the attorneys were sitting there looking at stuff that was attorney-client privilege, talking about it with a personal friend who's also a journalist. All of that could violate the Clennies as a whole, their right to a fair defense. And that's not okay. Do your job right. And one other thing I was thinking about early on in reading this was the accusation of Rundle's prosecutorial office, the state attorney's office, trying to win by any means necessary. And all I could think of was how, with the Courtney Clenny case specifically, since it was named here in this press release, we've got to consider that the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office wasn't even willing to take that case for several months. And reading this, this argument, I wonder what the estate of Christian Obamselli is thinking. Right? Because now you've got two different groups of attorneys. You've got a civil attorney. You've got the civil action on one side. You've got the two criminal actions on the criminal side because there's two cases. If Jude Facadomo is saying, hey, it's outrageous what you're doing in the, the Clenny's cases, the laptop case and the companion murder trial for Courtney, what you're doing there is prosecutorial misconduct. And we know in the laptop case, they've moved for a motion to dismiss. That was the most recent activity filed there on the 8th. There's been a witness subpoena since, and the defense has submitted a witness list. But with that being said, we're going to wrap it up here. There is supposed to be a status hearing in the murder case at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. If there's a stream, I'll pull it up. We can have the live chat going. Um, but really just a closing thought for me. I think the prosecution should always do a good job. They're the ones that are supposed to be held to the standard of pursuing justice. A defendant, as an individual, has certain rights that we should not give that don't belong to the state. And as much as I might have my personal feelings, and you guys are all welcome to yours, I might have my personal feelings about where I'm leaning, what I think the jury might decide in an individual case, I always think the prosecution should get to that argument, should make their argument in the court in an appropriate and just way. And I would like to see a strong response from Fernandez Rundle saying, hey, this isn't just going to be water under the bridge. This is some pretty serious stuff. And we're going to look at it to the extent that we need to review and make sure no other injustices have occurred. And with the ongoing cases, we're going to review what's going on there as well. With that being said, you guys, let me know your thoughts. We've seen a lot of back and forth in these motion hearings, you know, Frank Prieto and Sabrina Puglisi saying, you know, the prosecution's acting kind of funny here. They want to shut us up. They don't want us talking to the press. But then at the same time, if we hear, and this is supposed to be true, that Quinnen is talking to a personal friend at the Miami Herald, David O'Valley, that's certainly hypocritical. Just, I think, flat on its face, that would be hypocritical, right? But really interesting stuff. It's always really interesting to see the bar come at the, an attorney's office. So it's a group of lawyers coming at a group of lawyers. And that's always interesting. I don't see any of the motions available to read, but if they do become available, I don't know if I'll want to read 118 pages on a stream, but I'll look at the interesting bits and we can talk about it then. You guys take care until next time. Have a good one.